Dr. Ingesh Gowda, sir, principal scientist, ICR, NINP, Bangalore, Karnataka. He is talking about aflatoxin, feed safety, and uh, amelioration. And another speaker, Dr. Vishal Mudbil, is a principal scientist, ICR, ARB, Hisar, Haryana. And he will be talking about uh, micronutrients for the optimizing livestock field science production. These are the primary things, as you all know, that uh, the, uh, while, while growing the animal for the uh, healthy food, uh, healthy food production or the meat production, we need to have take the proper pre-production at the production level, at farm level. So these two eminent speakers will contribute to their expertise and their experience uh, in their uh, particular knowledge. So I request Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. Vaidya, the organizing secretary, to introduce Dr. Uh, N.K. Gowda, sir, for the participants. Thank you very much, sir. So once again, I welcome all the participants and I welcome the speakers of today's session. Uh, Dr. N.K. Gowda, sir, has completed his BVS and AS from Veterinary College, Bangalore, MUSC and PhD in Animal Nutrition from Indian Veterinary Research Institute, Kitatnagar, Postdoctoral Fellowship from University of Missouri, Columbia, USA. And presently, he is working as Principal Scientist in Animal Nutrition Division, ICR, NIA, NP, Bangalore, that is uh, National Institute of Animal Nutrition and Physiology. Uh, his major areas of research and development are newer feed resources, feed quality, and micronutrients. He has more than 28 years of total areas of uh, experience, means research experience, and he has published more than 101 research articles in national and international journals. He has commercialized four technologies to the industry industries and uh, he has published and uh, granted three patents uh, uh, yeah, uh, in the government websites and he has also given uh, uh, 30 radio as well as television programs so this is very uh, brief biota although he has many achievements uh, with his uh, in his credit so with this uh, few words now i uh, invite and request Dr. N. K. S. Gowda, sir, for his presentation. Sir, please. Sir, you are not audible. Gowda, sir, you are not audible. Uh, okay, now I am audible, I think. Yes, sir, you are audible. Yes, uh, I am going to share. Uh, yes. PPT should be opened on the desktop. I opened it. Share. Is it okay? My PPT is uh, visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. So, I think... Uh, you uh, PPT mode, you just slide mode, you put. Slide mode, I am trying. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Is, uh, I think is very visible. Yes, sir. Visible. Uh, once again, good morning and uh, uh, thanks uh, the organizers uh, for inviting me uh, to share my uh, technical views on the topic of aflatoxin and uh, its amelioration strategies uh, in animal feeds. Uh, uh, respected uh, participants, I think uh, we have participants uh, across the country from representing different institutions and uh, students. I welcome uh, once again. Uh, this aflatoxin, as you know, is a, a major problem in the feeds. So it's a never-ending problem, as you know, that uh, is related to the climate and uh, so many other uh, things which are beyond our control. So we have to live with this problem and having some management strategies. So there is a saying, uh, uh, a world without mycotoxins is a world without food. 
that means uh, any food you have at least some toxins will be there like uh, fungi will grow and there will be some mycotoxin production so this is a ubiquitous uh, problem everywhere uh, this problem is there and uh, uh, each feed will have some mycotoxins or the other so on average about 25 percent of the world's food grains are contaminated so that means uh, it is a, is a, a big problem which is beyond our control so only thing is we have to uh, do research and development and how strategies you can uh, control it and uh, you can manage it we have to manage this uh, issue we cannot completely eliminate this uh, problem of mycotoxins so this today's toxin uh, toxic uh, discussion toxin discussion will be an aflatoxin so as you know that there are so many uh, mycotoxins so uh, important are uh, aflatoxin aflatoxin so other the toxins also there like xerodinone and uh, pimonizins so many are there so uh, among that our indian countries most important is aflatoxin so that's why today's topic i'm restricting uh, restricting myself to aflatoxins so as you know that uh, the mycotoxins are fungal secondary metabolites produced by the toxinic strain of fungi so there are uh, many fungi which are not toxigenic so there are some uh, fungi like aspergillus the aspergillus also some strains which are non toxigenic so some strains like aspergillus flavors and aspergillus parasiticus so there are toxinic strains so they produce the uh, the secondary metabolites in the form of toxins so again in that so approximately 10% of the secondary fungal metabolites can be classified as mycotoxins all are not toxins so all the metabolites we cannot say they are toxins so only 10% of them are uh, uh, having the toxic uh, nature so uh, coming to the livestock uh, sector so among the feeds livestock feeds you can uh, list the grains are uh, susceptible and oil cakes are uh, susceptible so again this uh, uh, problem comes from the moisture the moisture humidity and temperature so these are the trio so these three factors put together uh, produce this problem so as such this fungi will be there in the uh, soil there are saprophytic uh, organisms and they will be present in the feed as a spores in the form of spores or mycelia so once this uh, all three moisture humidity and temperature conducive uh, for the growth of the fungi so it will sporulate and produce the mycotoxins as such uh, if you control the moisture and humidity and temperature and they are they are under control once uh, the favorable conditions of moisture humidity and temperature comes so there will be fungal uh, toxin production yeah like you can see the uh, damaged uh, grains the infested uh, grains so these are the generally we find uh, in the uh, feed conditions so as i told this uh, particularly this aflatoxin producing uh, fungi so aspergillus is a saprophytic is present in naturally in the soil so that's why this groundnut you can see the groundnut shells uh, will have this uh, spores invariably so because the, it comes from the soil so again in the uh, picture you can see the fungal spores will germinate and produce mycotoxins and there will be mycelia against sporulation against fungal spores is a cycle so this will happen whenever there is a favorable conditions uh, for the spores to germinate so that i will tell which are the favorable conditions yeah so this how it uh, looks in the microscope uh, this aspergillus uh, this fungi and uh, the contaminated uh, grains contaminated uh, feeds so uh, moisture of uh, more than 10 to 14% suppose if you control the moisture less than 10% i think you are bit safe and again humidity 65 to 70% so or some of the hot humid uh, conditions uh, it, it will be favorable conditions for mycotoxin production so like seasons like early monsoon and winter so we have this uh, little more moisture and more humidity so these are the favorable conditions like hot humid uh, climate and again this uh, whenever uh, you process them particularly like pellet making the heat uh, condensed to moisture so uh, heat of around more than 35 degree centigrade again uh, if you don't cool it properly and uh, pack it and the heat condensed to become moisture so there is another uh, condition where uh, the mycotoxin aflatoxin production will be there so these are the uh, favorable condition moisture humidity so both should uh, occur together so then uh, spores will germinate and produce the toxins so again in the aflatoxins we have uh, uh, aflatoxin b1 b2 g1 g2 based on the heterocyclic uh, structure in that b1 is more prevalent so present uh, more uh, uh, prevalent and uh, this is more toxic than b2 and g1 g2 so all species are uh, almost uh, susceptible so poultry is more susceptible and dogs also susceptible pig cattle buffalo and the sheep so all are including human beings so all are uh, susceptible to this problem yeah this is uh, one just data i want to show this i told uh, this uh, season effect of season 
and the toxin production. This one survey, this uh, article, you can see the in the winter and uh, summer and early monsoon, you can see the uh, uh, this uh, presence of the toxin. The data I can show. So total uh, around 709 samples. Uh, so range uh, of aflatoxin varied from 1 to 4 ppb. Mean level is 122 per uh, mage and ground at 139 and aflatoxin B1. 66 to 82 percent samples are positive. Again, this uh, you can see the late monsoon, the 167 samples are positive and 65 ppb were the aflatoxin content. So that means season has a major uh, influence on the this toxin production. So late monsoon where you can expect uh, higher moisture and higher humidity and also uh, temperature. So these uh, two factors influence the uh, toxin production. Again, one more uh, uh, the survey you can see. And the uh, wet period showed significantly higher level of uh, aflatoxin contamination, just like early monsoon. And uh, again, this aflatoxin B1 in high compared to commercial and fresh feed. So that means even uh, when the feed is uh, packed commercially, when there will not be any toxin, or the toxin may be below the uh, permissible level. But uh, uh, when during transportation or in the farmer or anybody in the uh, dairy farm or the poultry farm, if the keeping uh, conditions are not good, again, uh, toxin may be produced there. So not that when it's transported from the industry, toxin may be uh, nil, but uh, at the farmer level after a week time, toxin may be present. So that's why this, uh, uh, this uh, data uh, is indicates. Yeah, I told is uh, four categories of aflatoxins, B1, B2, G1, G2. It's based on the fluorescence, blue and the green fluorescence uh, in the TLC. And uh, this aflatoxin B1 is more common, is more toxic and carcinogenic and teratogenic. It produces uh, certain defects, genetic defects. So generally what happens on injection through the feed, in the gut it is absorbed and in the liver it is get metabolized. So our uh, liver uh, system, the cytosolic uh, system, uh, try to metabolize to less toxic products. So B1 gets uh, converted to M1. There are so many. There's a big uh, uh, metabolites uh, will be produced. So, and uh, in the aflatoxin M1 is one is very important. It comes in the milk. So, but it is uh, less toxic than B1 because it's uh, 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 detoxified and uh, converted to a metabolite of aflatoxin B1, but hydroxylated metabolite of aflatoxin uh, B1. So it comes in the milk and uh, meat. So is uh, of concern of the residues in the milk and meat. So the export and uh, the, the quality. So nowadays is based on the aflatoxin B1 in feed and aflatoxin M1 in the milk and meat. So there are uh, stringent uh, laws are there nowadays BAS and FSSA are uh, regulating these uh, parameters for a better quality of uh, milk and meat. So again, the poultry and uh, young animals are more susceptible. Cattle and other ruminants. So we can say partly uh, less susceptible because the uh, rumen, you know that rumen, so because of the rumen microbes, uh, rumen protozoa particularly, so part of the toxins, uh, this aflatoxin is degraded, but not, but still uh, ruminants are susceptible, but uh, poultry is more susceptible because uh, mm, there is no, uh, in the stomach, they're not degraded. Directly they come into the blood, liver, and they get uh, produce the toxicity. Yeah, this is how the metabolism, aflatoxin B1, so produces so many epoxides. So many derivatives. So some uh, they cause the the genetic changes in the cell, adapt the carcinogenesis. So each one have a different uh, role. Uh, aflatoxin M1 is highly carcinogenic. It comes in the milk and meat. So like this, each aflatoxin B1 derivatives in the liver they have different functions. This is what aflatoxin B1 to M1. You can know this uh, cattle uh, consuming on the contaminated grains or contaminated cakes or the contaminated feed. It comes to the milk. As aflatoxin M1. So, uh, generally 1 to 7 percent of the B1 is excreted in milk as aflatoxin M1. So, that's why this aflatoxin uh, B1 in the feed uh, is uh, fixed the level, so for 20 ppb. So, and uh, milk is uh, 0.5 ppb. So, this is uh, depending on the conversion ratio. What is the conversion ratio of B1 to M1? So, generally it varies from 1 to 7 percent. So, they fix the uh, safe level or the, uh, the maximum limit in the feed as well as in the milk. So again, this is uh, the, uh, the time required to appear in the milk, 8 to 12 hours of post-feeding. So this is uh, uh, 8 to 12 hours of uh, ingestion of B1, so M1 will appear in the milk. So based on this, the, again, the withdrawal period, suppose the animal uh, consumed uh, the uh, contaminated feed, and uh, this uh, withdrawal period should not consume the milk for 6 to 8 to 72 hours. Withdraw the feed after 60, 68 hours, 68 to 72 hours. 
almost uh, three days. So uh, animal that milk should not be consumed. So that that uh, after that only the production M1 will be uh, not present. This is the withdrawal period. So this is the pathology. See, this uh, I told uh, it affects the liver and kidney and uh, immune organs. So poultry, dairy, swine, dogs, and humans are uh, most susceptible. In the liver, it causes a pale and fatty liver, a hepatocyte uh, degeneration, and biliary hyperplasia, interlobular fibrosis. So almost all the histopathological changes will be there and hepatic tumors. I told this is all due to these uh, metabolites of apotoxin B1. Some are epoxides. So they bind with the cell, they cause uh, all the cellular degeneration and apoptosis and ultimately it produces the uh, cancers, cancerous condition. You can see in the picture, the apotoxin, uh, very pale liver. You can see in the uh, liver, pale and uh, necrosis in the liver. This is what the uh, cellular changes it can uh, bring, apotoxin toxicity. And uh, these are the permissible uh, limits, very, very important. Nowadays, uh, safety regulations are very stringent. I told uh, the BIS and uh, FSSA in India, they are uh, regulating this, they are recommending. So, compounded uh, feed, apotoxin B1 is uh, in USA is uh, 20 ppb. Uh, we are also almost following the same thing. But uh, European uh, unions, the European countries, very stringent, 5 ppb, very difficult to uh, maintain, but uh, they recommend 5 ppb. And apotoxin M1 in the milk, 0.5. And uh, in, the, in the US, and uh, we India also we are uh, following the same uh, parameter, uh, same level. 0.5 ppb is the upper limit. And uh, cereal individual grains. So I uh, in 20 uh, ppb in USA and uh, uh, European Union also 20. But India we are relaxed to 50 because uh, individual ingredients added to the compounded mixture. So up to 50 we are uh, allowing. So but ultimately when you mix a, a different ingredients, make a compounded feed, the level should not exceed 20 ppb. And I'll see meals also in India 50 ppb. Uh, this is the level. Yeah, this is what uh, the background information of the aflatoxin, uh, their uh, nature, their toxicity, and the animal susceptible and all. So the most important uh, in the beginning I told. So this problem will be there with us. So because uh, the spores will be there in the environment, in the soil, in the feeds. So only they germinate when uh, suitable uh, conducive atmosphere of uh, temperature and humidity, the moisture uh, is available. So then we have to manage this. So this is the uh, uh, most uh, important aspect. So one is uh, prevention. So uh, how to prevent this fungal contamination? How to prevent this uh, spores not to germinate? That's the first thing. So if at all, if you fail in this aspect, so there will be uh, fungal toxins uh, production. How to detoxify them? So aflatoxin is already present in the feed. How to detoxify? This is the second. And uh, in spite of the second also, there will be some toxins which are uh, entering into the system. They go to the blood, they cause the mycotoxin, aflatoxicosis. So how to gear up the body metabolic system? How to fast convert to less uh, metabolites, less toxic metabolites and excrete them? So and ameliorate, support the body system, support the liver, support the kidney, antioxidants, so that the animal will recover fast from the, these uh, toxic end products. So just uh, I have, I think, uh, focus more on this, uh, how to uh, prevent first. The first aspect is prevention. The best way is to uh, follow measures, how to prevent this uh, fungal uh, proliferation and produce the tox toxins. So harvest the crop at proper maturity. So one thing is uh, uh, so that the moisture can be managed properly and dry the produce and commodity as quickly as possible. So the, sometimes there'll be problem in the post harvest uh, uh, aspect. So, but uh, always the commodity before you store, it should be dried properly. Less than 10% moisture is ad advocated. And avoid physical damage during handling and transport uh, storage. So, when you damage the grain or damage the cake, so it's easy for the microbes to, uh, spores to uh, go in and uh, proliferate. So, and monitor the moisture level. It's very, very important. Moisture level is very, very important. And avoid the, avoid storing the warm grain to prevent moisture condensation. I told in the beginning also. Suppose you dry the grain, suddenly you uh, put it in a bag and uh, close it. So because the residual uh, heat will be there, so that get condensed and uh, suppose the moisture from 8 to 11, it may go. So like this, uh, you should take care while uh, when you, uh, the warm the grain, dry the grain. So allow them to cool to the room temperature yeah, and then only you store. Otherwise, there will be condensation of moisture. And ensure that the storage uh, go down is uh, leak proof, well ventilated. Keep the bags away from the wall and uh, prevent the insect damage. 
and avoid loading and unloading during transportation when there is a damp and rainy. So these are the uh, tidbits uh, you have to follow for transportation and uh, management. And uh, sometimes uh, you can use the mold inhibitors like uh, antifungal compounds. So I can uh, in the next slide I will uh, discuss in detail organic acids like uh, benzoic acid, citric acid, propionic acid. They all have uh, we have studied them. So organic acid they have antifungal effect. So they can neutralize this spores. They, they can neutralize the fungus so that uh, it will not be able to proliferate. And uh, even urea, suppose the, we add uh, urea in the uh, component mixture up to 1%. So it has some other benefits also apart from nitrogen source, it is uh, antifungal also. And uh, ammonia you can, but it is all uh, limitations are there. In the ruminant dates, yes, it is, but poultry date you cannot use all this. And copper sulfate, to some extent copper sulfate higher than the requirement if you add, it is antifungal. And uh, there are some antifungal herbal compounds like turmeric, ginger. So there are all uh, some theoretical information. Some are actually being used in the feed as antifungal uh, compounds and the toxin binders. So all those things are there. So this is what I was just telling. This uh, steam cooked uh, this pellet contains less fungal spores. But uh, before packing, avoid moisture condensation, particularly pellet making. So pellets will come. So inside there will be a heat because the pellet uh, is subjected to heat. Uh, for making the pellet. So, if you do not cool it, so then there will be a heat, then it gets to moisture condensation. So, you should avoid it. And uh, whenever you cool it and pack it, declare the moisture level while packing. So, this is one uh, SOP, standard operation procedure you should follow. And this is what just a, a, a small, uh, maybe a dairy farm, a small unit, we are st storing the feeds. So, it should be well ventilated and uh, see that uh, uh, you should use uh, pellets. So that uh, the moisture is not absorbed from the ground and it should not uh, touch the walls. Suppose the wall is little damp during the rainy season. So likely that some bags will uh, uh, get that moisture. So see that uh, uh, this is a well uh, storage, good storage practices are uh, followed. Yeah, just uh, some of these antifungal com copper sulfate, very, very good antifungal. So we can add to ensure that uh, there should not be again a secondary problem of copper toxicity and all. So add such a level. So, like 0.1%, so and mix properly so that it acts as a sulfur uh, supplement also, sorry, sulfur and copper supplement and also antifungal. But only thing to ensure that the level does not exceed and propionic acid for ruminant dates, no problem. Propionic acid, there may be some color discoloration of the feed because of propionic acid, because an organic acid. So, but uh, for ruminant date, it is not a problem, not a toxic because uh, rumen has already propionic acid, citric acid, benzoic acid. So, ammonia also not a problem. So, different level, maybe 0.1% is safe and benzoic acid, clovile, very, very good antifungal, but uh, cost is the factor. So, you can see clovile, you can see the uh, colonies, very stunted colonies uh, when you add clovile because very, but uh, using in the animal date may not be plausible because of its uh, cost, it's a academic information. And some of the herbal like pepper, garlic, turmeric, caranjile, clovile, eucalyptus, neem oil, they all have antifungal property. You can see in the uh, petri dish. The number of colonies have been reduced or number of colonies have been stunted. That means it is a, the, the fungus or fungi is not able to grow when these uh, herbal additives are there. But at least some can be used, particularly like turmeric or caranjile. Some small level you can add in the diet uh, so that uh, antifungal effect will be there. Like neem cake. So uh, neem cake in IVRI and a uh, lot of work has been done as a protein supplement. Maybe uh, when you use uh, it as a source of protein, it will give some antifungal uh, benefit also to the feed. Maybe small level, maybe 5%, 8% if you add in the diet, it's not toxic and uh, it uh, produces the antifungal effect also. So as such, you know, this uh, neem cake, current cake, if you keep open, so no fungal will come because uh, they are themselves for antifungal. So uh, fungus doesn't grow on uh, these cakes. So like current cake also, same, same effect of uh, neem seed. These are the uh, some of the efficacy and level of these uh, uh, the antifungal uh, chemical agents like propionic acid, sodium propionate, benzoic acid. We use it around 0.1 percent, 1 percent, urea 0.5 percent, ammonia, copper sulfate 0.08 percent. So these are the level you can use in the uh, compounded uh, feed, uh, mix properly so that the antifungal uh, property will be there. And these are the herbal agents I just uh, explained: the clovis, neem oil, neem seed cake, turmeric, onion. Of course, the academic and for onion dal you cannot add in the diet, but uh, they have that property. They have that property. So it is an academic information. At least some we can try. 
commercially when uh, these herbal uh, powders are available. So you can add in the day. You have antifungal and antioxidant property also. So you can get that benefit. Yeah, this is about the uh, prevention aspect and secondary uh, measure. So uh, fungus is already there. It is already producing the toxin. So then what measures we can uh, follow? Secondary measures, second aspect. Stop the growth of infested fungi by redrain the commodity. Then you know that uh, there is some fungal contamination. So at least you can arrest the further growth by redrying it. So I don't know how is uh, possible at industry level, big tons of feet is manufactured. Again, redrying, uh, can you design some mechanism that you should think of? Isolate and remove the contaminated uh, seeds, grains. Suppose some bags are affected, some top bags or some bottom bags are affected. You can just remove uh, those bags and isolate from the whole flock, whole uh, lot, sorry, of the feeds and dilute the uncontaminated, uh, dilute with uncontaminated feed before use. Suppose few bags are affected, you can uh, just above the normal level of the permissible level, you can uh, dilute that feed with the uncontaminated feed so that uh, uh, the contamination level will come down. This is one strategy. And uh, if it is heavily contaminated, you should have to dispose and preferably you have to burn it. So you have to dispose it or send for uh, this uh, decomposting. So this is the last strategy. So again, the safe moisture level, is preferably less than uh, 10 to 11 percent in the for all the category of the feeds grains oil seed cakes milling by product like cakes and uh, this wheat bran rice bran so relative humidity they say preferably less than 50 percent but uh, in indian conditions difficult to achieve very difficult either uh, there will be more, more moisture there will be more heat or combination of like semi arid or arid uh, regions so there will be temperature there will be humidity so difficult but uh, less than 50 percent relative humidity uh, is uh, you cannot, uh, fungus will not grow on this uh, humid level. Yeah, this is the again uh, counteraction how to detoxify the toxin which is already present in the feed. So, one is the physical mechanism, like uh, nowadays, uh, is the uh, poultry is very uh, common now. Now, they use uh, this uh, toxin binders like uh, silica binders, HSCS, hydrated sodium, calcium, aluminum silicate. This is a charged uh, like mining product, it is a mine, it is, is nothing but a sand or a soil, so purified soil. Has uh, charges which will absorb, absorb the not absorb, absorb the toxins. So then the gut is not uh, eaten to the blood, it is just excreted. And bentonite, charcoal, so these are the physical binders. So already industry is using it and at different level. And uh, another glucose, this is a biological product, glucomannans. So these are the cell wall uh, uh, mighty of the yeast and the other bacteria. So binds with the toxin and excreted without getting absor absorbed in the gut. So again, this efficacy of these binders varies from uh, toxin to toxin. And uh, other thing is the heat, the, the, the heat or the UV radiation. So this uh, uh, aflatoxin is quite prone, quite susceptible for UV radiation. So there will be uh, a natural detox detoxification, like the structure of the mycotoxin, you saw that heterocyclic structure. So that structure will be partly broken down. So it will not have the toxic, uh, original toxicity effect. So it will be less toxic. So heat treatment of the feed and uh, sun drying is also one approach. But uh, how far is practical in a big way? Like uh, tons of feed are you able to dry it in the sun is a question mark. So these are the, some of the chemicals also can be used like lime, sodium bisulfate, urea, ammonia. And here uh, when you add and uh, mix properly, there will be destruction of the fungal this uh, group, that uh, functional groups, so which is responsible for the toxicity. So loss of biological activity and again one problem is I told discoloration of the feed, consumer acceptance, known as environmental uh, guidelines. So use of chemicals is uh, not a primary option. So you have to as far as possible you have to avoid using chemicals, avoid uh, using of all these uh, non-environmental uh, friendly uh, things. So safety aspects. So this is one thing. So best is the biological. I told uh, the, the microbes derived uh, products like glucomenon, cell wall, uh, some bacteria, yeast. So they are the may, uh, gaining importance because uh, they are available in plenty. You can uh, culture them, grow them. So unlike our uh, binders, they are you know, finite. They are from the soil. They are from the uh, this uh, uh, mining products. So one day uh, that may be a finite uh, product. So they will not be available. So but this bacteria, uh, yeast, you can grow them. You can culture them. So it's a fast uh, 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 like gaining prominence in this. Uh, mycotoxin or aflatoxin management uh, strategy. So either the bacteria will degrade the, uh, these aflatoxins to, to make less uh, toxic ones or biotransformation, completely cleave the 
uh, uh, clear the um, toxins and make uh, less or non toxic things. So, these are the binders, the clay. You can see this HSCS, how they can uh, uh, trap the toxins and uh, it is not uh, available for absorption in the gut. So, they are excreted in the uh, feces. And uh, yeah, these are the uh, yeast cell wall, MOS, monon, uh, oligosaccharide, beta glucans. So, they are from the biological uh, product. The, I just I was uh, telling about the efficacy of drying, sun drying or the heat drying are quite effective. So, in our experiment, 10 to 14 hours sun drying, almost you can say two days, 10 to 14 hours active sunlight. So, as a thin layer, 28 to 37 degree centigrade. So, there are up to 90 percent of toxin uh, B1 uh, was uh, destroyed. That means the uh, lesser byproducts were available, but B1 was not there. Maybe it was uh, converted to less uh, toxic products. So, like similarly drying may not be practically possible, but uh, uh, 100 to 120 degrees centigrade for 2 to 3 hours. So, there are around 65 to 70 percent of toxin uh, was reduced, like degraded. So, but again the question is here, uh, how these approaches can be uh, applied on a large scale. So, industrial level may be uh, some engineering tool may come uh, drying at a faster rate, drying on a bigger scale may be possible. So, how to dry tons of feed in the sunlight, they are all practically. Uh, problem, but at small farmer level. So, maybe a farmer having two cows, three cows, or a small farm. So, he has a, a backyard where he, he can get sunlight. So, he can dry it. Suppose it has more moisture, and uh, we can, if you estimate some toxins are more, like more than the uh, permissible limit, he can dry it, right? And at least 50 percent of the toxin can be removed. So, it's possible, but in a small scale, is possible, but industrial level, you have to think. So, these are the information available. Uh, for uh, use, but how to put it to use? So that is a challenge that uh, many engineers and uh, industry people should uh, think how best that can be tried. So possibilities are there, but uh, there are some practical uh, problems. So this is what the the glucomenon I was telling. Uh, this uh, cell wall of the yeast. So this uh, not only an aprotoxin, it is effective against other toxins also like zirulinol, pimonazines, T2, uh, tricotecin, and uh, citrine, aprotoxin A, and uh, deoxin A. Uh, these are the different uh, toxins produced by the fungi. So, these are the efficacy. The aflatoxin 95 percent. So, a, a good uh, biologically active yeast uh, glucomenon binds 95 percent of the toxins. Very, very effective. Very good approach also. Uh, but only thing is the efficacy sometimes varies. Uh, it should be active and it should be uh, uh, live. So, these are different products are there. Different uh, is a biological approach. Uh, it has different efficacies. So, this is the efficacy. See, 500 gram of glucomen is equivalent to almost 8 kg of silicated binder. So, 1 is to 16. A good glucomen, if you use, so uh, 500 gram is equivalent to 8 kg of silicated binder. So, this is the advantage with the uh, biological uh, products. Major advantage is we can reculture them and uh, enough we can produce in your own laboratory. Unlike this uh, silicated binder, you have to procure from a mining uh, industry. Is, uh, Again, I was just talking about some of the microbes, particularly the bacteria. We can uh, biotransform uh, or degrade uh, the toxin, like aflatoxin. So I listed other toxins also. So lactobacillus strains, trichosporon, rhodotorula, rubra, and these are all the uh, like bacteria and microbes. So they have this uh, property. So that's what uh, sometimes the approach should be dual. So use them as a probiotic, and also uh, when uh, toxin, aflatoxin is there in the feed, so they can counteract this aflatoxin to some extent. So, these are the synergistic effect uh, these microbes have. So, I think uh, that's what I was uh, keep telling. So, biological approach is a more sustainable approach. So, we should uh, start. Uh, I think industry is already using this, particularly poultry industry is using this. So, the third approach is amelioration. So, first is prevention, second is uh, contract the toxin, which is already present in the feed. So, third is amelioration. So, uh, first uh, step and second step uh, you could not uh, succeed in a major way. So, Toxin has already entered the uh, system. It's already in the blood and the liver, kidney. It is already producing the harmful effects. So, how to ameliorate the toxicity? So, like uh, one is a nutritional approach, like uh, supplement the heptotropic nutrients like uh, methionine, choline, essential uh, fatty acids, and the B complex. So, it's just a supporting mechanism. Support the liver. So, fast uh, detoxify and uh, eliminate the toxin. And use of antioxidants, vitamin A, vitamin E, selenium. So, all the antioxidants. So, which will uh, see what happens is the uh, toxins in the liver in the affect the cell, there will be radicals produced, oxidants, radicals, peroxides. 
So this process has to be removed by antioxidants. So like vitamin E and uh, selenium, vitamin C is a very good uh, water soluble antioxidant, vitamin A fat soluble antioxidant, keratinides, suppose some of the keratinides like uh, xanthophylls, all those things, and plant derived natural compounds, some photochemicals, curcumin, polyphenolics, they all have the antioxidant property. So some of uh, the studies you may be, lot of literature is available, use of curcumin, like turmeric and uh, ginger, so many uh, like photochemicals, uh, 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 they have this antioxidant property. So thereby not only aflatoxin, so other toxin effect also they will be able to ameliorate. So they have used against uh, aflatoxin with some uh, variable success. So completely they will not be able to cure it, but they are supporting amelioration is a like amelior is a relative term, is a relative term. So they will be able to help the body to overcome this uh, toxicity uh, problem. Yeah, curcumin just because the way I am showing, I did work on this uh, and published a good paper. So it is a uh, uh, good, is a good antioxidant and antifungal also. If you add in the feed, it acts as antifungal and also the curcumin of uh, turmeric, it is uh, having antioxidant property and it promotes the immunity and so many uh, beneficial effects of, are there of this uh, curcumin. Again, this is the biological uh, control is using enzymes in the field, like uh, chitin and glucan, is fungal cellular components. So, a uh, use of chitinase. See, this uh, chitin and glucan this is a uh, fungal fungus, this is aspergillus. So, these are the components. Chitin and glucan they are the component of the fungal cell wall. So, if you can break them, so the fungus itself is destroyed. So, one is using chemicals uh, destroy the fungus. Second is uh, using these enzymes, chitinase and gluconase, and uh, break the cell wall of the fungus. So, fungus is lost. Is not live, it uh, doesn't sporulate and produce the toxin. This is one uh, uh, approach. So, this vessel uh, subtilis, it produces uh, chitinous enzyme. So, when you supplement the live microbes, so this is effect we can uh, uh, leave. When the fungus is there, fungus is destroyed by the chitinous enzyme. So, we can supplement these enzymes also, gluconase enzyme, chitinous enzyme. So, all this biological approach. So, again, the trichoderma is a uh, agriculture like what we talk of uh, some of the microbes for animals. So, trichoderma is a very, very important microbes for the uh, soil uh, agriculture and uh, plant uh, people. So, this also will be a very good, uh, it has beneficial effect and it produces chitinase and helps in biological control of the pathogenic fungi. Sometimes, this kind of natural counteraction does happen in the environment. So, this the chitinase enzyme is uh, produced with trichoderma in the plant. So, naturally, some of the asparagus are contracted, they are destroyed. So, Natural contraction is also possible uh, with the trichoderma and aspergillus uh, contraction. Yeah, this is the binding. I was uh, just telling some of that uh, yeast and bacteria, their binding. These are the uh, binding efficiencies, number of strains binding with aflatoxin B1. So, le less than 15 percent binding by Saccharomyces. So, more than 60 percent, some strains. So, these are the uh, strains which are having that binding uh, property. You have to select the best one. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the best one. So, like Lactobacillus uh, plantarum. So, we have to test and uh, select the best strain which has the uh, maximum efficacy in uh, either binding or the biotransformation of the uh, toxin. Yeah, this is another uh, like uh, strategy uh, generally is not followed like uh, forecasting in advance. Like uh, you forecast whether uh, this uh, lot of feed, this uh, bunch of uh, tons of feed, you take some samples and uh, whether it's going to produce toxin. is possible because of this microarray and biotechnology, possible, chips are available. So, uh, as you know that this fungus is, is a gene, it is a fungus spore, they have some genes which will produce the mycotoxin. So, those genes you isolate and uh, okay, if the genes are uh, in abundance, so then in a given opportunity of uh, moisture and temperature, within few days, uh, mycotoxin will be produced. That should be our prediction, like forecasting. So then, if you are, if the genes of that uh, mycotoxin producing uh, set of genes in the uh, feed, it is the more more than the permissible. Then immediately follow some antifungal uh, measures. Maybe if possible, dry it or add some antifungal agents. Treat them with some uh, like antifungal chemicals. So different strategies I explain. So then that level only before the toxin is produced, you can destroy the fungus by uh, getting a clue from the genes. Yes, these are the genes which are already there in uh, abundance. So, within four or five days, if we are given a good temperature or a good uh, humidity, favorable for them, they will produce the toxin. So, uh, immediately you can arrest it. Just like uh, uh, 
arresting at the uh, entry point only so we can uh, this preventive aspect we can follow so this is what uh, what i say, think uh, i am not uh, very comfortable very convergent with this biotechnological tools so but uh, the tools are available i think uh, if any participant is a biotechnologist uh, uh, doing work on micro and all so it's just like a set of genes uh, already there they isolate the set of genes which are uh, responsible for the aflatoxin production i uh, detect them then and if they are more in number uh, then uh, you can uh, expect that this this feed will be contaminated it will produce mycotoxins you can add antifungal uh, reduce and you can control the uh, aflatoxin production see the early forecasting just like you forecast for the uh, flood or the rain so you take measures so translocate the people and uh, uh, move to safer places so similarly this strategy is possible i think in coming days i think industry should adopt this as is uh, detect these genes so if they are more in number than the permissible then immediately dry it and whatever the moisture level you check it and uh, and follow the all the the sop like operating procedures you follow so that uh, when the toxin is produced it is difficult to remove it either you have to detoxify it or when it comes to the body again a, a amelioration strategy supplement the nutrients all those things you have to follow but instead of that preventing is one of the uh, easiest method i think uh, coming days it may be a possible uh, in the industry as a diagnostic uh, chip will be possible so these are the uh, practical guidelines and sop standard operating procedures so early forecasting of the problem the type of crop suppose groundnut cake is more problematic and a maize so you uh, assess them which crop is more susceptible and uh, depending on the harvesting condition the moisture level and the uh, prevention is the uh, first uh, strategy less than 10 to 11% moisture and you can add antifungal compounds and uh, permissible level of copper sulfate urea sodium bisulfate sodium pro for the ruminant diets for uh, poultry it may be a problem we can have other uh, uh, safer uh, antifungal agents uh, for poultry diets and uh, always validate some of the time we validate in a small uh, quantity in the laboratory but in tons of uh, feed you have to validate it add and uh, see the fungal counts and then you have to validate and uh, use of uh, binders in selected seasons and selected regions so seasons means uh, like a wet season like early monsoon so this is a season where uh, you can expect uh, mycotoxin and selected regions like arid regions semi arid regions where have temperature and humidity both are there so that region you have to like a hot spot to identify them yes feeds manufactured or feeds preserved are stored in these regions or in these seasons are more prone so this kind of a uh, strategy should have so you should have the caution that fungal uh, mycotoxin could be a problem so in these uh, places and again i told is pellet feed condensation of the moisture so allow for cooling and uh, record the moisture before uh, packing so air tight and moisture proof uh, uh, feed bags and transportation should be waterproof conditions uh, like uh, moisture management using novel engineering techniques feed storage good ventilation and uh, use a uh, ground pallet so that moisture is not absorbed and identify risk prone areas and seasons hot spots i told so which are the areas where uh, like data is available which are the area which are the region seasons is problem is there hot humid uh, early monsoon or early winter of these uh, seasons and uh, to conclude uh, this i think i am well in time i think i can have some discussion also so i am just i think 7 minutes uh, before the uh, pro clock so in the beginning also i made it clear this is a never ending issue so we have to live with this uh, mycotoxin and particularly uh, aflatoxin is a major problem so because there is an interaction between the crop the climate and the environment and the feed so again our management so many factors are there so we have to live and uh, have the best strategy how to prevent this problem so we cannot eradicate this problem so uh, adopt appropriate preventive measure and the use of binders is uh, one of the approach like uh, binders hcas or the glucomenon so is a one effective way of uh, decontaminating the aflatoxins and feeds and the use of biological methods like uh, use of microbes use of uh, these enzymes uh, appear promising but again uh, the results need to be consistent because the biological material sometimes they are not efficient effective and you cannot have a good results so but it is an eco friendly approach and it is a renewable one we can culture these microbes uh, produce these enzymes in large quantity in the in the factory so like bio re reactors so though it is a bit expensive i think is worth uh, trying in view of the environment safety and, uh, rather than using chemicals 
and the phytochemicals uh, i showed the uh, information uh, some of them particularly curcumin turmeric and uh, they are practically available and you can use them so as antifungal and also antioxidant you can use them up to i think 0.1 or 0.2% you can definitely use it so it is worth uh, uh, using such uh, phytochemicals uh, herbal additives yeah a combination of sometimes uh, this strategy is also if one strategy doesn't uh, help the other one will help a combination of a binder a biological and an antioxidant so sometimes uh, they, they if you can in the feed manufacture formation you can see they have a, a, a silica binder they have some uh, phytochemical they have some antioxidant like vitamin a and vitamin e added in a little excess quantity more than the like uh, permissible so just as a margin of safety so it could help in situations of multiple mycotoxin contamination so nowadays just this uh, topic i am talking about uh, aflatoxin so rather the situation is multiple mycotoxin so aflatoxin is also very common because of uh, this uh, lecture i am dedicating for uh, aflatoxin i am not talking about uh, aflatoxin so this is also equally important so almost same biological effects are seen it is a nephrotoxic and immune suppression similar to aflatoxin so acra is very common nowadays other toxins also emerging so zerulinone so there are different toxins uh, list is there so now we have to have a strategy for multiple mycotoxin contamination not alone uh, aflatoxin so again one uh, like our uh, suggested strategy is development of mold resistant transgenic crops again uh, this is a gmo crop so there are uh, some uh, uh, leads are there uh, but again limitations are there in indian conditions because still we are not able to completely accept uh, gmo except the bt cotton so there are a lot of discussions merit demerits lot of uh, like uh, protests are there against gmo crops but benefits are also being shown uh, with uh, gmo crops that uh, safety aspects so again i think uh, the biotechnology consortium has made a board uh, to uh, verify this uh, uh, information and clear them for usage so there are uh, trails are there like uh, produce the uh, transgenic crops which are resistant to these uh, mycotoxins like this as such is fungi will not produce any toxins in these uh, crops so maybe uh, more of these chitinase more of these uh, enzymes which can destroy the fungus so uh, there is one strategy to produce the transgenic uh, crops so maybe in the future when the science advances uh, maybe practically available information so these are the common uh, farmer friendly approaches educate the farmers on feed storage and feed safety and they should be educated about this uh, toxicity problem because sometimes milk will be rejected if the toxin is uh, more than 0.5 ppb and regularly monitor the moisture level and relating packaging of feeds and there should be strict uh, guidelines the packaging of the bags and the water and air tight testing for mycotoxins other toxins should be tested nowadays i think uh, field kits are available so relatively qualitative testing is possible and uh, sun drying of feed if possible at small uh, farmer level is possible at a small level the concept of good feed storage rooms at milk society level so what happens suppose milk society is small room so they will just keep uh, unscientifically so i think uh, uh, rather uh, subsidy and other uh, encouragements we should uh, give encouragement for uh, good feed storage in the societies milk societies and uh, they should dedicated uh, milk uh, sorry uh, feed storage room should be there with all sops so moisture control ventilation all those things should be there and again uh, i was just uh, talking about uh, science like possibilities like uh, the forecasting and better management engineering techniques i think many institutes uh, were working on this aspect like nnp and cftri mysore and uh, their branches and ndb ndri so we should uh, work together on different components because uh, one institute cannot work on uh, one single component so different institute should join maybe some engineering aspect also some iit so how to dry it so we say drying is not economical maybe some technology may be there uh, faster and uh, economical drying technology may be there so we have to explore these uh, aspects so again uh, so far i was uh, just talking about uh, beyond like feed only so there are aspects beyond feed also to manage this problem uh, they say uh, this processing of milk autoclaving or any this pasteurization doesn't remove much of this uh, protoxin but some studies are there microwave heat and uh, binding the toxins and separate them so many technologies are being tried so If the toxins are there by separate them by using binders so food grade binders so all the studies are available so one uh, report says that 80 degree centigrade 45 second heating in the milk 
63% of products in MRI is lost. So this should be validated, tried at a large number of samples. So it should become a technology. And again, nanotechnology also they're trying food grade binders. Suppose aflatoxin M1 is there, use some food grade binders, they bind with the mycotoxin, sorry, aflatoxin M1. So it is uh, not harmful to the uh, human beings in consumption, particularly the infants and all should be very careful. So such uh, promising uh, information will be available in uh, coming days, uh, some nanotechnology, food grade binders, so all this. Again, as you know that uh, science is a part of uh, possibilities, uh, is possible, but only thing the effort should continue. So some reports uh, may be negative, but some few reports may be positive, but uh, we have to uh, continue the efforts and uh, uh, produce the worthy results. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, I'm in time. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to throw some light on the aflatoxin information is very, very impo important. And your theme of this uh, workshop, this uh, program is also on safety. So aflatoxin is a major one, uh, like our uh, heavy metals, lead, cadmium, and other things. So hopefully uh, this information will be of much use to each one of you. So back to the other for any discussion if time permits. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much, sir, for a very nice presentation. In detail, uh, you have mentioned all these aspects of aplatoxin, feed, uh, feed safety, and ameliorations of these, uh, whatever the aplatoxins in feeds as well as what precautions, management aspects, uh, what we, uh, preventive measures we can use for the prevention of fungal contaminations, you have covered in a very uh, excellent manner, uh, ameliorations of toxicity, then antifungal antioxidants, and use of biological uh, control measures by using enzymes and other measures, you have very excellent way you have mentioned, sir. Yeah, it is uh, very important uh, Yeah, that you have mentioned that uh, Education to the farmers is uh, very important for the awareness uh, and uh, that is required and regulatory monitoring is also very much important. So uh, thanks a lot, sir, uh, for your very excellent presentation. Now I request the participants uh, for the questions, please. Uh, sir, in chat box, uh, I'm seeing the question is there. Yeah. 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 Does aflatoxin have any taste? Can we find out uh, by testing whether uh, meat is contaminated with aplatoxin methods are there spot tests are there uh, nowadays the milk society is also there following uh, qualitative tests are there uh, spot tests are there tests are there yeah i think read out sir i'm not able to the chat yeah. Yeah. Not able to find here uh, you can read the question, sir. I'll be able to answer if possible. Uh, that was uh, only one question. Or any other participant, they can ask directly. It was uh, very good information. Uh, Shall I unshare the slides? Shall I unshare? Yes, sir. Yes. You can unshare the slides. Yeah. Now it will be. Chat, chat box. Okay. I think Dr. Gopal. Uh, yeah, only one. Uh, uh, does the production have any taste? <laughs> I don't know. I have not tasted it. Uh, can we find out uh, the tasting whether a uh, meat is converted? Uh, I no, definitely it has some test. Is a heterocyclic uh, toxin definitely uh, test? It will be bad test only. It is an organic heterocyclic compound. But I think uh, at, uh, finding by testing, I think it is not a recommended uh, practice because the toxin. Yeah, I don't uh, anybody can uh, test with his tongue and tell is this toxin is present. So I don't think it is a recommended way. But definitely it will have some bad test, I'm sure. Yeah, any more uh, questions? Yeah, not sir. Sir, I'm not talking, sir. Sir, sir. Dr. Gopal, uh, you are not audible. Uh, you can uh, write in chat box. Totally, how many attended this session, sir? Around uh, people. 147 participants are good, there, sir. Good, good, good. Yes, yes. Hopefully, they are there right? because last time we have conducted, so many just uh, they muted uh, both audio video and they were not there. <laughs> <laughs> Happened, sir. One uh, manage uh, program, 
so then i yes. started i started asking them the say like, like aruna pawar uh, chaitra jadia so yes. they were not there in the seat this will happen unless this one the limitation of online uh, course yeah so that's why sir every day uh, because it's a uh, total four week program so every day we are taking uh, a snapshot also yeah yeah we're taking group photo also sir now also you can test uh, randomly i think some will be they joined uh, put the audio and video on mute and they'll not be there on the seat yeah and what we have done sir no better i think chat box is better i think not yeah. <laughs> dr gopal you can uh, you can write in chat box your voice is not clear sir in case of pasteurized milk sir is it free form not possible sir no you can in case of the pasteurized milk sir is it pasteurized milk so they say pasteurization uh, doesn't guarantee that uh, production ammonia is free is not completely effective thank you sir thank you sir both questions are very good questions ramtek sir is also there sir now yeah yeah hello sir <laughs> good namaste. morning namaste sir namaste so uh, very nice presentation sir yeah thank you sir uh, on behalf of uh, organizing committee i am very much thankful to you because on the very uh, short notice uh, when i contacted on behalf of the organizer you immediately agreed to deliver the session so i must thankful to you sir and uh, uh, again uh, in the future also you will uh, your lecture will be helpful in yes. different aspects so again i hope that you will be there for uh, delivering uh, the lecture in different training programs sir yes yes yeah my pleasure uh, not only aphrodoxin so micronutrients and feed resource patient balancing so all this i think uh, i'll be able to come uh, like uh, complement all this information so i can uh, be able to make a presentation yes thank you, thank uh, once you. again yeah i request all the participants please start your video for group photo okay thank you very much thanks a lot sir yeah, for thank you sir thank you thanks sir yes thank you very much thank you sir thank you now we have uh, second speaker eminent speaker dr vishal mudgal sir dr vishal sir are you there i am here sir Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay. So, before I request you for the presentation, uh, I will give just a brief introduction about you. So, regarding uh, Dr. Vishal Mudgal, uh, he is working as principal scientist, ICR, CIRB, ISR, Haryana, and uh, sir is going to present his uh, uh, topic. on micronutrients for optimizing livestock health and production so dr vishal mudgal uh, he completed his bbsc and bbsc and msc in uh, animal nutrition from college of veterinary science and animal husbandry mau uh, madhya pradesh in the year 1999 and 2002 respectively he did his doctorate degree from center of advanced faculty training in animal nutrition at ivri in the year 2005 he started his research career as a research associate for about 1 year at ivri and on 4th december 2006 joined as assistant professor at college of veterinary science and animal husbandry jabalpur 
and served for about six years with noble profession of teaching. After selection through ASRB in August 2012, he joined as senior scientist at ICR Central Institute for Research on Buffaloes, Hisar, Haryana. And presently, he is working as, as I said, he is working as principal scientist at uh, CIRB Hisar. His major field of research is micronutrient nutrition. He has contributed significantly towards enrichment of poor quality fibrous feeds, developed uh, of chelated tr uh, trace minerals for ruminants, and area specific mineral mixture for uh, tribal villages of Udaipur district of. Rajasthan. He also remained associated with several institutional, inter-institutional and AICRP projects on ruminant nutrition. Dr. Mudgal has the honor of receiving Dr. U.B. Singh Memorial Young Scientist Award for the year 2012 and 14 from Animal Nutrition Association, Associate Fellow of Animal Nutrition Society of India in 2019, Honorary Fellowship of uh, Association of Animal Scientists in 2020 and membership of NAVS in 2021. He has guided three MUAC students as a major uh, guide and six as minor guide. He has published more than 23 international and 47 national research papers. Five practical uh, manuals he has written, several compendiums of lectures, authored one book for undergraduate practical course and edited one book for buffalo uh, farmers in Hindi. So with this very uh, uh, brief uh, introduction, although uh, as uh, he has many achievements, many uh, he, uh, honors, he is having awards and all, but very in short, I have uh, uh, mentioned here the point achievements I have mentioned here, uh, very uh, brief introduction. Now I request and invite Dr. Vishal Mudgal, sir, for your presentation. Vishal, sir, please. Thank you very much, sir, for kind introduction. And I am thankful for the organizer for giving me this opportunity to interact with the participants and express my research works and associated uh, related with the topic I have to cover. So here, I am here with for uh, to start the topic mainly that is the so here I am interested uh, and being provided the topic that is the micronutrients and micronutrients are very important nutrients because they are really being omitted usually. Sir, put in uh, PPT mode, PowerPoint mode, you can. Uh, yes, okay. sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, so the micronutrients are very important because we are not mainly concerned with the micronutrients because these are required in very small amount and usually being ignored. And our main emphasis should be there to incorporate these nutrients to get the optimum productivity from these animals. Because the purpose of, our purpose is to get the optimum productivity, especially with limited resources. When we are talking about India, we are having limited resources and the limited resources remains required to be associated with the optimum productivity. So we have to keep our main focus towards the micronutrients because the most of the other micronutrients are being incorporated in diet and being considered while micronutrients are being neglected every time. So here we will focus on the micronutrients, how different micronutrients works and what they are having, deficiency signs, what deficiency signs are there, and how we could incorporate them in diet. So here, we know that the health is closely associated with the nutrition. And when we consider that the health is optimum, that we are performing optimum as per the 
nutrition. What nutrition we are being provided is depends over the mental, mental as well as the physical health. So they are the closely associated. When, when we consider the nutrients, nutrients are broadly categorized into two, that is macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients are the water, carbohydrate, protein, and fat, which are being, as earlier I said, that which are being taken care of properly, while the micronutrients, that is the vitamins and minerals, are being ignored. So we have to keep them as main focus to get the productivity optimized from the livestock. So regarding vitamins, vitamins was, uh, vitamins term was given by Funk, then it was being considered as the vital amines at the time of its introduction or at time of its discovery, because they were amines. Later on, it was being considered as the vitamin, because not each vitamin was the amine. So these vitamins are the essential organic nutrients for and requires in very small amount. And major repetition is that, that they can't be synthesized in body. That's why we have to take care of supplying these through diet. When we could consider the other animals like ruminants, some of the vitamins get synthesized in their rumen and microbes are able to synthesize. And like vitamin D, sun is able to convert vitamin D into active vitamin D. So these are the others we have to keep in mind and we have to give regular supply through diet to get the optimum productivity. And these are required for normal growth, maintenance, reproduction, as well as lactation. So broadly, we could classify them into fat soluble and water soluble vitamins, because as per the solubility, fat solubles as name indicate that it is soluble in fat and we have to provide it fat as a source for its supplement. So it is a storage in tissue, mainly the adipose tissue. And that's why regular intake is not essential. That means fat soluble vitamins can be stored when we are taking the, that uh, vitamins in excess amount that as per the requirement of body. So that will get storage in the body and whenever they will be deficient in feed, they will be supplied through body. And these are the storage capacities there. That's why they are not regularly required in the body. Includes vitamin A, vitamin D, E and K. While the another category is the water soluble. Water soluble are the vitamins as name indicate that are, they are water soluble and no, they can't be storage, they can't be stored in the body, and that's why they are regular supply to the diet is essential. These are mainly the B complex vitamins and vitamin C. So, first we could start about the fat soluble vitamins, major vitamins, vitamin, major vitamin is vitamin A, that is mainly associated with the cell lining and epithelium, epithelium cells are the mainly associated with the vitamin E. When we find out that it's fat, it is having its effect on the skin as well as the nerve tissue. And when, if there is any problem in supply of vitamin E to the body, so epithelium cells of the body get destructed. And that is the reason why Vitamin A is mainly known as NPT infective vitamins because the line of defense of the body get destructed and infection could get hindered. That's why the deficiency of vitamin lead to the infection condition and also known as vitamin A is also known as anti-infective vitamin. So most of all are aware that the vitamin A is associated with the vision and that is the reason that deficiency of is lead to the nyctalopia. That is the problem to be a problem to see in night because the uh, product requiring the cones is not get properly synthesized. And that's why it is produce the night blindness 
and the condition is nictolopia. So it is mainly associated with the sign, sight, and likewise the xerophthalmia. That is also the drying of conjunctiva. And it is also mainly known as nutrition rope in case of poultry. And it, it also affects the vision when it is advanced. So keratinization of epithelium is the main function being associated with the vitamin A. And I already told that that is, is also known as anti infective vitamins and also associated with the formation of kidney stones because it work as the focus on which the uh, uh, kidney stone get developed. And it is both, both vitamin A is associated with the, both the sexes with reproductive problems. And especially the nervous lesions being associated with the cerebrospinal pressure is increased, increased and lead to ataxia. Uh, retinic acid and there are parts of there are the supply supply takes place mainly the retinic acid through the beta for the vitamin E. Then this what are the source? Source may be the usual dietary source are the whole milk in case of the ruminant uh, calves and why is it is carotene because in case of ruminants. These are the carotenes, and carotenes get converted through. It is present in the green roughages, and it is converted to vitamin A, and as well as the oils. That I also told that the it is a fat soluble vitamin. So the vitamin A is rich in oils, maybe the vegetable oils, and especially the animal oils like the cod liver oils and other liver oils, as well as the legume forage is also rich in vitamin A in the form of carotenes. And then the requirement, regarding the requirement, the requirement is 110 international unit per kg of the body weight in case of lactating animals. And as I already told that it is associated with the health of epithelial cells. That's why it is required high quantity in case of lactating animals. Why? When we consider the dry animal. The requirement is about 26 international unit only. Now, the second important vitamin, fat soluble vitamin, is vitamin E, that is tocopherol, and it is mainly associated with the reproduction. And the meaning of tocopherol is also to give birth. So, vitamin E is mainly associated with the reproduction function and also work as the natural antioxidants in cell, it is present in cell membrane, associated with the fat and work as the natural antioxidant and also having a sparing effect of the vitamin A. So also helpful, vitamin A is also helpful with the immune function for normal functioning of the immune system. It is also having more important role and that's why in case of the mastitis, when we are interested to address the mastitis, the role of vitamin E is also very high. So, regarding the deficiency signs, poor growth is very important, and there is the crescentic disease in case of the birds, and in case of ruminants, that is the white muscle disease. The stem limb is the disease associated with the deficiency of vitamin E. Regarding the sources, as I already told that the uh, cereal grains and the fat soluble fat is the main source and the fat containing things like the cereal grains fat portion is having rich in vitamin A even in the wheat germ oil. So concentrates include the protein source the protein rich concentrates also rich due to their uh, having their oil content. But the major problem associated with vitamin E is that, that having antioxidant role and when it is being exposed with the atmosphere, the quantity get reduced due to the denaturation. So proper care should be there that we can't put the higher oily things at higher amount at higher temperature or an hygienic condition. So it will reduce the amount of vitamin E in feed. So storage condition should be optimized 
when we have to keep vitamin E content safe in diet in feed. So regarding the requirement, the requirement of vitamin E is 2.6 IU per kg of the body weight. And when we will tell about the antioxidant effect, vitamin E is having a associated role with vitamin uh, middle selenium. Selenium is also a antioxidant vitamins, and both these work simultaneously. So after vitamin E, vitamin D, vitamin D is the sunshine vitamin because this is not directly produced in human body or animal body, but it is being converted through the sunshine. If, if it is present in the water, uh, so if it is present in the plant in the form of aldosterol, and when it is attacked by the ultraviolet radiations, it converted to the activated vitamin D. So vitamin D is also important in bone growth and bone development because these are calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D are having the complete interaction to provide healthy and normal bone. So bone is a very effective target to through the vitamin D. If vitamin D is sufficient in diet, which is usually there in case of the our condition because animals are more accessible to the sun heat, sunlight. So, but in case of usually we do not consider it as important because sunlight is sufficient in case of our country and we do not even usually exposed with the deficiency of this vitamin. So this vitamin is mainly in the form of vitamin D2 and D3 for its supplementation and D3 is more active and more potent in case of the ruminants. And D2 is only 10% active in case of poultry. So the eggs are the rich source in case of human, if we can say, while usually we go for oils, if we have to consider its supplementation, though not required in Indian diets especially. And requirement is having 30 IU intrinsic unit requirement per kg of the body weight. Likewise, vitamin D, vitamin K is also rarely being considered as important because vitamin K is easily get produced in ruminants. So it is by as vitamin K, it is associated with the blood coagulation. That's why it is having its name as vitamin K, having role, population role. It is mainly having three source of supply, vitamin K1, K2, and K3. K3 is the synthetic one, and K1 is the present in green plants. That is philopenone, while two is get synthesized, K2 is synthesized in through bacteria. So as I already told that blood population is the main, role of this vitamin K and usually deficiency is not being observed, but could be observed when we are having is anti-vitamin D, like we are having sweet flower, it is if it is moldy, so it works as the source that vitamin K availability will be lesser and it produces the deficiency of vitamin K and the signs of vitamin K deficiency get developed. So after this red soluble vitamins, we should move towards the water soluble vitamins. Water soluble vitamins are the big complex vitamins having a great range of the vitamins. It started with the vitamin B1. Vitamin B1 is the thymine and it is well known by its deficiency sign, very very, and polyneuritis. So vitamin B1 is associated with the nervous function and these all the vitamins are the complex vitamins are mainly associated with the enzyme and coenzyme role and thus they are important either in the form of that already written previously 
that some of important in case of the blood cell synthesis and others are important in the metabolism so recarboxylation step is the targeted step being placed by thymine having its role in glycolysis and deficiency at i have been told that very very is the main deficiency sign and it lead to accumulation of pyruvate lactate and oxalo of the oxalo glutarate which produces peripheral neuritis so that's why that the neuritis is the main sign and nervous nervous symptoms are being produced in case of vitamin a deficiency then that's why the star gazing condition is the common star gazing posture is the main symptoms associated with the deficiency of this and polyencephalomalacia is also there and what are the sources of the vitamin b1 thymine that is the raw and whole grain and that is the main reason that uh, if we could go for the sufficient supply of the vitamin a vitamin vitamin b1 we have to keep the amount of concentrate sufficient as per the requirement green forage is also a good source so these are the source and because we, we do not consider main deficiency for vitamin b complex in case of ruminants because the as already i told that the main source is the microbes and they could synthesize themselves for host animal so in case of ruminants the requirement of b complex is not as such only b12 is required and that also required cobalt and that's why the microbe scale uh, due to presence of cobalt microbes can take care of the vitamin b12 also. so as such all the b complex vitamins are not dietary essential they could be synthesized in room now regarding vitamin b2 that is the riboflavin that is also important for the reproductive function that is embryo development it is and it is also that i told that the all these are associated with the fn fm and an fad required in carbohydrate metabolism for energy production so this b2 is also involved in the energy production and nervous symptoms are the main signs produced due to deficiency so this is also inability to maintain the epithelium integrity and chicken it is known as the curled toe paralysis the specific paralysis takes place in toe and also the club down condition so by finding out the conditions because i told that the vitamin b complex is mainly synthesized in ruminants through microbes and more study is been taken out in case of poultry birds so they are where the requirement is essential so now regarding the next vitamin that is the vitamin b3 niacin allegra or blutron so nicotinamide is associated with the nad and ndph metabolism and yes sir you are not audible ha huh. hello ha ah, yes now, so now. so next regarding vitamin b, uh, yes yes i already told that the vitamin b is mainly associated two functions one is associated with the
सर यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल डॉक्टर मुदगर एन फैट सिंथेसिस सो इट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एंड स्पेसिफिकली इन केस ऑफ पिक्स द गोस स्टेपिंग इज द साइन वी कुड डिटेक्ट द डिफिशिएंसी ऑफ विटामिन बी5 इज देयर नाउ द विटामिन एच और विटामिन बी7 आल्सो नोन एज बायोटिन इट इज आल्सो ए इंपॉर्टेंट रोल इन केस ऑफ नॉन रूमिनेंट्स and having its role in carbon dioxide fixation and the as regarding the biotin it is being known as that the egg egg should not consume raw in excessive amount because evidence is available in there and that work as the antibiotic so proper care should be taken into that that excessive amount of egg should not be consumed it could be harm the biotin level of your body no uh, folic acid folic acid is also associated with the maturation of the blood cells it is also known as vitamin b9 and glutamic acid is the precursor it could be synthesized and helpful in the transfer of the single carbon unit molecules so here here deficiency signs are specific in the form of macrocytic and hypochromic anemia because and also it is known as the megaloblastic anemia because the size of cells get increased in larger in size and the pigments are higher so it is the macrochromic macrocytic and hypochromic anemia hypochromic anemia that the pigments are less but the size of the cells are large that is macrocytic cirrhosis is seen this case of the non ruminant situation and choline it is a thoda sa doubtful hai it is also a part of the amino acid and also is been considered as the vitamins and required in the constitution of the phospholipids lecithin and work as the lipotropic factor and help in the transfer of the methyl group the deficiency may be seen in the form of the pyrosis or slip tendon it is associated with the problem with the movement of your leg now the vitamin b12 as i already told that vitamin b12 is a vitamin require mineral in its structure vitamin b12 require cobalt and it is also known as cyanocobalamin and remain associated with again remain associated with the blood cell maturation and anemia produced by this vitamin deficiency is known as anti pernicious anemia as in case of it is also known as cow manure factor because the manure produced by the ruminants remains hey having sufficient amount of the vitamin b12 so it is also present that because as i already told that vitamin b complex is synthesized in rumen through microbes so Through micro, it got synthesized, and it may be available in the manure. So that's why it is also available, also known as cow manure factor. And especially in case of the uh, vegetarian and vegetarians, it is limiting amino acid, limiting limiting vitamins because it is also known as animal protein factor. It may be available in milk, and if we are not taking milk. and it is complete if we are complete vegetarian so it is the major deficiency we could we could face that is the vitamin b12 deficiency so proper care should be taken into consideration if we are purely vegetarian that could be a deficient vitamin in our diet so here here that is the difference that vitamin b12 get stored at its storage capacity in liver so 
regular requirement is not essential. And the as already told that the it is also having the the macrocytic animal that is the larger size of cells in blood that is immature blood. So after this, after this B complex vitamins, another water soluble vitamin is vitamin C that is known as ascorbic acid. And vitamin C is having is important role in case of collagen synthesis as well as the muscles uh, gums. It, it was being discovered in the in the persons moving through the ship for longer duration and they were unable to get the fresh supply of the diet and that's why the deficiency of vitamin C was discovered there. So it is the ascorbic acid and having main antioxidant role like vitamin E and vitamin a, it is also having the antioxidant role and deficiency sign as already told that the vitamin C is not required in case of the ruminants. They could synthesize through microbes and here the human way they said I told that the gums are the main problematic issue when vitamin C is the deficient. So scurvy is the main, scurvy is the main symptoms being shown in the deficiency of vitamin C. And sources in case of non ruminants, it is the citrus fruits, tomatoes, leafy vegetables, potatoes. These are the common source of vitamin C or ascorbic acid. So, this was all about the vitamins. Now, we have to move towards the inorganic constituents. These are the minerals. So, inorganic constituent minerals, they are mainly divided into the Two broad categories that is the macro elements and micro elements, or we may say the major elements. So, and micro elements could be divided into two further categories that is the trace elements and ultra trace elements. When the requirement is very, very small amount, so it is being considered as the ultra trace elements. So, minerals, minerals having very much interaction among themselves and one of the minerals if having an excessive amount that could interact with the another mineral which may be in deficient amount and due to that interaction the deficient mineral could get could get more deficient due to reduced biology so it is having complex interaction so a proper proportion in diet for each mineral should be taken into consideration. If one of the mineral is very high, that may affect the availability and utilization of others. So, actual amount of minerals has to be taken into consideration. And some of the minerals are getting uh, reduced availability due to their complex, like the antimetals, phytates, and oxalates. They affect Phytates affect the utilization of phosphorus and oxalates affect the utilization of calcium through diet. And the present mineral status also plays an important role. When, when we have sufficient amount of iron in our body, the absorption of iron gets reduced. So these also play a very important role. And form of minerals, that which form you are being provided the mineral is also play a very important role. If if we have to the normal normal source of mineral is the inorganic mineral, inorganic salts. And if we have to increase the absorption, we have to change the source. If we are getting the source that is organic minerals, that means the organic molecule is being combined with the inorganic element. So the availability or the absorption of the element gets converted into the form of the organic molecule. And that's why the availability is higher and the bioavailability will be higher. Likewise, the nanominerals. Now it, the nanominerals is also being smaller in size. So bioavailability is, could be higher. So thereafter, genetic variation 
as well as the age, sex, and productivity also plays a very important role. Accordingly, the requirement of different mentors could be varied. As most of us are aware that the main in element is the calcium and phosphorus. And most of the part of the our body is being synthesized through these two elements, mainly the bone and teeth. The body is made of about 3% of the organic element. 99% of the total calcium is present in the bone and teeth. So, normal adult bone is having 45% water, 35%, 30% of the organic matter, while 25% of the inorganic matter. When we go for the concentration to the on fat on moisture and moisture free basis, we have to talk about muscles. So, fat or moisture free basis, pay, that is having 36% calcium, 17% phosphorus, and 0.8% magnesium. So, now detail in detail about the calcium. So, calcium is the major macro element. As I have been told, that the macro elements are seven. So, that is the major element calcium. Calcium helps in blood clotting and having an important role in muscle contraction and neuromuscular excitability. And that's why we see that many of the problem, reproductive problem like the expulsion of placenta and other reproductive normal functions require calcium. And also the amount of calcium is very high in case of milk. And that is the reason why that the milk fiber is the common condition being produced in case of a pregnant animal just after parturition. Excessive amount of calcium get removed into the blood, from blood to the milk. And that's why the blood level of calcium get reduced and animal suffer from the milk fever. So it is having associated with the other complex phenomena, but usually it is being considered that the calcium is present in bone also, and bone also work as the source of calcium, but it takes times when just after parturition that calcium will not be available for the blood, but it get increase hoga level, and by that then the calcium will be available to the blood. So initially when higher amount of the calcium get secreted in the milk. So it affects the milk production as well and the animal get suffer from the milk fever condition. So that's why the immediate action takes place in the form of the half amount of the calcium being supplied through intravenous road, route and another amount through the intramuscular subcutaneous. So that, that, that is the thing that calcium deficiency is very high and which lead to the problem. So what, what are the source? In case of ruminants, usually we go for the dicalcium phosphate and dicalcium phosphate is the source of calcium as well as phosphorus. Why? Right? Specifically, if we are interested for calcium, so limestone will be the major source in case of ruminants or birds. Now, regarding phosphorus, as I already told that calcium and phosphorus have a interaction role, major interaction role. When higher amount of calcium is there, it could reduce the availability of phosphorus. When phosphorus is deficient, higher amount of calcium will reduce the, will even show the deficiency of phosphorus. So, it is very important role and it is being considered that 2 is to 1 is the normal ratio which we should keep in mind for the diet so that the proper utilization of both the minerals takes place to get the optimum benefit. As I already told that the dicalcium phosphate is the major source of phosphorus as well as the bone meal which is not being usually practiced now in case of the ruminants and fluorine is the major concern that whatever DCP and other source of phosphorus source we are providing that it should be having less less fluorine. 
so regarding calcium and phosphorus i already told that the both having the relationship and the availability of one get disturbed due to the excessive presence of another and already told out that that the vitamin d is also having a important role in calcium phosphorus metabolism metabolism because it is having a role in the calcium binding protein lactose also having a role in increase the calcium absorption and as i already told that the minerals are having very much close interrelationship to each other and high calcium aluminum and magnesium and iron reduces the phosphorus absorption so always we have to keep into consideration that the what other minerals are present in the diet and how they could not interfere with the availability of other minerals so it should be taken into proper care so the osteoporosis is the condition in the associated with the calcium phosphorus and other are also associated that uh, mainly they are being targeted towards the bone functioning decades osteomalacia and osteoporosis are the condition associated with the deficiency of bone calcium or phosphorus and as i already told that the bones are the storage house for the calcium and it is being observed as the osteodystrophy fibrosa that is the excessive fibro excessive phosphorus intake takes place in case of the horses and non ruminants so it is the condition and there is a specific peculiar condition associated with the deficiency of phosphorus specifically phosphorus takes place in it is known as pica where animal is being consuming unwanted or un absorbable things like animal will try to catch the soil we will try to swallow the soil we will lick the anything anything whatever it will be available so so it is the deficient sign of the phosphorus known as pica so that uh, in addition to calcium and phosphorus magnesium is also important for the bone and teeth health it is having 70% in bone and teeth so magnesium is having its role mainly in the form of the ATP to transfer the energy, so it is also having a main role. But but usually usually deficiency of magnesium not being takes place because greens are the very rich source of magnesium. And it sometimes sometimes if we are having the immature plant parts, so they are causing the deficiency of magnesium. magnesium and specifically at the time of lactation also deficiency could be arise so also known as the deficient symptoms known as lactation tetany grass tetany in case of deficiency of magnesium now regarding the acid base equilibrium in the body that is we have to maintain the osmotic pressure and what are the minerals associated with this are the sodium potassium and chlorine these three, three minerals are there which are closely associated with each other and associated with the acid base equilibrium in the body so sodium is mainly present in the inside the cell and it is the base for the cation and deficiency of sodium like uh, being pro provided through salt and having its deficiency in the in case of poultry cannibalism so it is the main deficient symptoms when birds fix the other birds so it is the cannibalism and it is deficiency of sodium so regarding potassium potassium is the present inside the cells and it is the present in the blood cells and also having its role in the balance while chlorine is the distributed in both places and that is the major anion in the 
system. So, so sodium, potassium, and chlorine having their important role to regulate the osmotic pressure. So, what is regarding the common salt? Common salt is the source of both this sodium and chloride and being recommended at the rate of 1% in concentrated mixture to, to overcome the deficiency signs. But it, it mainly depends on the toxicity, maybe depends on the availability. Sometimes uh, it is when saline, saline water is there, some problem could be there because so in that case, the intake of water is the limitations. If, if it is limitation, then it creates the problem. So deficiency signs of the it is the poor condition and appetite is also depressed because it is associated with the normal functioning of the saliva secretion. Now another major element that is the sulfur. It is entirely in only combination. Usually, not being provided is the in only combination. And is the mainly is only combination. And the sources are maximum whatever mineral sources we are providing. They are having that sulfates as a base. If we are providing copper, that is also through copper sulfate, manganese, zinc, all are being supplied through the sulfate form. So indirectly, it, it remains as a source of supply. And it is sulfur is very important in case of wool. Wool, wool is being mainly synthesized in the presence of sulfur, and that's why it is being considered that the proper ratio of nitrogen to sulfur should be there, or proper utilization of nitrogen sulfur should be there, and it should be ranging from 10 is to 1 to 15 is to 1 for optimizing the utilization of each other. Sulfur containing vitamins are there, thymine and biotin are the sulfur containing vitamins. So, deficiency of sulfur could be associated with the cellulose digestion. Now, after these major elements, there are seven major elements we have discussed here. Now, the micro elements, trace elements. So, trace elements are the iron, major, major element which is required in higher amount. The iron required is about 40 ppm in the diet. And but, but nowadays, due to the agriculture appliances, the concentration of iron remains high in most of these soils. And due to high in soil, that absorption takes place and that also remains high in the feed ingredients. So usually, Iron did not remain the major concern in case of animals because mostly it is being excessive in normal diet of animals. So iron is mainly associated with the blood formation as we are all are aware and usually the deficiency mainly takes place in case of the when the thumbs you are most of our may be aware that the labored breathing it is associated with the pigs and the due to its role in the hemoglobin synthesis, depigmentation is also a major deficiency signs if it is available. So at, at I already told that, that the absorption of iron takes place through the lumen and the GIT. And that uh, takes place if the iron level is high inside the blood. So, mucosal block theory is there and that works. And when iron is there, the absorption of iron may be Vishal, sir, you are not audible. Hello? Dr. Vishal?
सर यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल डॉक्टर विशाल also having is storage at liver and deficiency having different types of signs like the as i already told that the copper is also having a complex interrelationship with another element that is sulfur and molybdenum copper molybdenum sulfur that is a complex interaction takes place in the soil where the molybdenum is excessive it reduces the absorption of copper so molybdenum is produced and it reduces the absorption of copper and sometimes when the deficiency of copper is actually is not there but due to higher amount of molybdenum the deficiency in terms of copper being seen as i already told that tyrosine is the enzyme and that's why the stele or stingy wool is the condition being shown in case of the wools when you are having deficiency of copper in diet and also copper is associated with the heart functioning because having its role in the enzyme lysyl oxidase so heart collagen collagen is the major part that's why it affect the heart functioning in the form of the lysyl oxidase enzyme and that, that regarding the toxicity sheep is the major animal where the we have to take into proper consideration about the amount of the copper in diet because with very small amount of the copper also it could be toxic so sheep is more susceptible towards the toxicity of copper we should proper taken into consideration uh, regarding cobalt so cobalt is the another trace element or we may say we may tell is the ultra trace elements like selenium it is also the ultra trace element required in the ultra trace amount and as already told that the cobalt is associated in the structure of vitamin b12 so cobalt directly or indirectly helps in the blood formation so this having the deficiency of cobalt produced in the form of anemia that is the normocytic and normochromic anemia that is the main observation regarding iodine we are most of all are aware that the nowadays iodine is having a important element and even being supplemented through the salt most of the salt we are taking are the iodized salt so iodine is a very important element and deficiency produces vital and that is the reason that the government also start incorporating the iodine so that the deficiency could not be happen so usually in case of animals also we are having the supplement maybe in the form of the iodized salt so this should be taken into consideration that cause iodine is mainly associated with the metabolism rate and deficiency or excess of both in both the condition it affects the growth rate it affects the fattiness and that's why that the body weight gain and body weight fall is mainly associated with the iodine deficiency or excess and it is also associated is role in the enzyme hormone thyroxine now another trace element is the magnesium magnesium is also having a role in superoxide dismutase as i have told that superoxide dismutase is the antioxidant enzyme so also having its role in arginase thymines and deficiency is mainly produced in the form of sleep tendon and perosis and it is also having its role in the chondrodystrophy because it is associated with the 
spontaneous synthesis and that's why the collagen synthesis gets affected and it shows its symptoms ataxia in case of the newly aged chicks may be the reason of the magnesium deficiency now zinc zinc is also a, uh, a interactive element and zinc and copper having a complete interaction to each other and a definite proportion should be there to get the optimum utilization of both these elements zinc is having a carbonic anhydrase that is the its constituent enzyme alkaline phosphatase also zinc containing enzyme so zinc is mainly absorbed in case of the skin hair and wool zinc as also told that that the copper manganese are associated in the structure of the antioxidant enzyme superoxide dismutase so 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 here zinc is also a part of the that enzyme deficiency is the paracrylidase that is the skin skin problems takes place due to deficiency of zinc and that is the major symptoms being shown paracrylidase in case of pigs fluorine fluorine as i already told that it is the toxic element and we should proper taken into care that sufficient care should be taken that excessive amount of fluorine should not be taken to diet and that's why we prefer to not take defluorinized we have to take defluorinized dcp in diet to avoid the excessive intake of fluorine so it is the cumulative poison and main symptoms are shown that it affects the teeth and bone formation so here is the that is the toxic element and we should proper taken into consideration for avoiding the use of excessive fluorine in diet now molybdenum it is also a trace element and as i will i already told that there is a complex interaction takes place between the copper molybdenum and sulfur even molybdenum is essential element due to its role in the enzyme xanthine oxidase or dehydrogenase sulfur oxidase and it is very important in chicks because uric acid synthesis is the major process in case of chick for the nitrogen disposal so molybdenum has a very important role because it is a component of the xanthine oxidase enzyme so i already told that the toxicity of molybdenum associated with the deficiency in the level of copper so we have to take into consideration that it should be balanced so that proper utilization of copper takes place and proper growth will be achieved now regarding the very important antioxidant element that is selenium yes i already told that selenium and vitamin e also having a associated role but selenium is also being considered as toxic elements because at excessive amount of the intake toxicity could take place and especially when we consider that the in the in our india area of punjab some of the area is associated with the toxic level of selenium in case of soil so it should also be taken into consideration that selenium should not be high in your diet but it is also very essential in the form of the antioxidant enzyme glutathione peroxidase so toxicity may be produced in the form of the acute toxicity or chronic toxicity may be known as the blind staggers and alkali disease and the nala disease is the common this i took out that the selenium toxic is there that punjab area is more selenium toxic so that's why the bengal disease remain associated with the toxicity 
and the specific symptoms are there associated with the selenium toxicity that the hair loss takes place from the tail. Tail will become hair loss, hair loss, and it will be clearly seen in the form of hair and well as hoof. Hoof problem will be there sometimes. Horn problem will be there. So hoof, horn, and hair that are the main associated sites where we could get the symptoms of its toxicity. So deficiency is, as I already told that the glutathione peroxidase is the antioxidant enzyme and that's why, that's why to get uh, some time we are having beneficial role for the supplementation of selenium because selenium is having antioxidant role. Glutathione peroxidase is the enzyme and that's why it if diet is not sufficient, we, we consider that the 0.3 ppm is the sufficient. It is also, it is already told that the selenium is also ultra fast element. 0.3 ppm is the requirement. And if we are going for higher, even 0 0.5, 0 0.6 ppm, even 1 ppm supplementation level or 1 ppm level of the diet, we could get beneficial effects because it is having antioxidant growth. Now, chromium, chromium is another the trace element and it is having association with the glucose metabolism. That's why it's also known as glucose modulus factor because it increases the in insulin action. So, deficiency may be critical. So, we have to take care of the supply of the chromium diet and to take proper care of the chromium. Especially, it is being also helpful to supplement chromium because, as I already told, that the glucose tolerance factor is associated with the chromium, and also it having a effect of anti-stress effect. So that's why supplementation is found beneficial, especially in case of the stress dynamic. If we are going for animal for long transportation. So if transportation is very high, and we are seeing that the stress condition is very high to the throat and those animals. So in that case, supplementation of chromium is found beneficial to be termed as the anti-stress effect. And the last uh, element is nickel. So proper research is being carried out. It is in considered essential for the UVS enzyme. So now we have considered all the vitamins and minerals. Now regarding the minerals, so how we have to supplement the minerals? So we have to supplement the minerals in the form of mineral mixture. And that mineral mixture, Bureau of Indian Standards have decided a recommended a mineral mixture and that is having the composition. So we have to provide that specific composition mineral mixture that is having sufficient amount of the that different elements, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, it is being shown here. So, and we have to take care of the toxic elements also that it should not be at higher level. That is as per the recommendation. So, we should go for the use of the GIS specific mineral mixture. And sometimes, nowadays, some specific mineral mixture are being developed by different areas. That is known as area specific mineral mixture. As I already told that the elements are being taken up by the plants through soil and through soil, through plant, into the plant and from plant it is come into the grains and whatever grain or green being taken up by the animals is remains the source of the minerals. So that's why whatever deficiency being present in the soil that get accumulated in case of the feed. And that is being transferred to the animal. And that is the plant, soil, plant, animal interrelationship. That if sub certain elements are deficient in soil, that will be deficient in plant, and ultimately that will be deficient to the animal. So that's why a specific mineral mixture is being designed at different places, at different areas, and that area specific mineral mixture are being used nowadays to get the 
proper supply of different minerals. So, if, if we are having a most of the area are having different types of area stress minerals, and we are having to suppose get more benefit and having a reducing reduced cost, then we will be able to get more profit by using that area specific mineralization. As I told that the iron is nowadays excessive in most of the soils and that's why the feed. So in most of the area specific mineralization, iron is not iron is not being added. That's why the area specific mineralization will be more beneficial and more economical. So it is being suppose that we have to use the area specific mineral mixture if you are having that area specific mineral mixture developed for your area. Thank you very much. So I think may I have tried all the aspect clear and convey to you. And if you find any difficulty or we could interact at some point of objection or, or some time some time of point of time if you not understand something you could interact with. yeah Th thank you thank you very much uh, dr vishal sir for very nice presentation you have covered in detail you have covered all the micronutrients uh, essential for optimizing the livestock health and production in a wonderful manner in detail you have uh, mentioned and you have presented in a very uh, time-bound manner. 